six years ago, the world of motorsport changed forever. For the first time, the FIA sanctioned an all-electric single-seater championship. And in September 2014, the streets of Beijing were electrified in the first ever race. Since then, we've had five seasons of incredible, Degrassi wins! unpredictable, wheel-to-wheel -wheel street battles in city centers around the globe. We've crowned four champions and seen the cars develop into the most advanced all-electric vehicles in the world. The championship features some of the biggest manufacturers on the planet that are battling it out to build the fastest and most efficient motors, inverters, and gearboxes to gain an advantage over their competitors. This technological warfare aids the development of the engineering behind the road-going electric vehicles that are helping to improve the air quality in the cities where we live. So far this season, we've had five rounds of incredible racing, hitting the streets of Diria in Saudi Arabia, Santiago de Chile, Mexico City, and Marrakech. We've seen five different drivers take the top step of the podium in an already action-packed championship. But unfortunately, like the rest of the sporting world, we've had to put the brakes on because of the worldwide pandemic of COVID-19. But here on Street Racers, we'll still be bringing you all the best action, news, and stories from the world of ABB Formula E. Coming up on this week's show, we'll be taking a look at some of the latest electric vehicle announcements, including an exciting peek at a brand new electric supercar, the Apex AP0. We spend some time talking to some of the drivers that took part in the Marrakesh rookie testing and seeing what they thought of the Formula E Gen 2 cars. Then it's EVs of a different kind as we take to the air on electric bikes. Plus, we take a deep dive into just how Diaz the cheetah driver and current championship leader, Antonio Felix da Costa, got to the top of the standings. But first up, whilst in Morocco for round five of the championship, Audi Sport driver Lucas Degrassi headed away from the circuit in Marrakesh to check out one of the largest solar farms in the world. So guys, if you have any doubt on how powerful the sun is, I'm gonna do a small example. So basically what you do, you take the sun with the magnifying glass, compress into a single spot, and in a few seconds, smoke starts to appear, temperature is rising, few hundred degrees, you can see that. A few seconds, and the whole thing is burned. Now imagine thousands and thousands of uh, hectares of this technology is just unbelievable. We are here at Bazarzate at the NOR project. It's a huge, huge facility. And what they are doing, they are using two technologies to produce uh, electricity from solar power. We are here with Yazir, and he's gonna explain a little bit how the technology of producing electricity works. So the, the whole uh, complex is producing uh, around uh, 1.8 tera so watt hour. 1.8 trillion watt hour per year. Per year, yes. Okay. And to give you an idea about the size, is uh, is can feed around two million people. And this uh, complex will save Morocco for 900,000 tons of carbon emission. So Nor 1 and Nor 2, called uh, concentrated solar power. So we are using the parabolic mirror to maximize concentration of solar light. And in the middle, we have this tube with the synthetic oil. Yeah. So solar hits the mirror, yes. goes to the to center the tube. To the center. Hits up the oil. The oil, and then we, we transfer all this synthetic oil to the, to the power block. To in the power block, we have systems to generate steam, and then we use steam to generate electricity. Yeah. So we are using part of the thermal energy to heat a molten salt, to store this molten salt, and to use it after the sunset to keep producing energy. We can keep producing during seven hours after the sunset. Nord 3 is concentration also, but it's different technology. There is only flat mirrors. They are reflecting solar light directly to the top of the tower. And inside this black receiver, there is a molten salt. So we are using all those panels to reflect solar light to the top yeah. to heat the molten salt. And then the same process, we are using this thermal energy to produce steam. Black part goes up to what? How many degrees? It's 580 degrees. One year of production of this site is equivalent of 100 
thousand seasons of Formula E. You can charge 34 million times a race-ready Formula E car. That's a lot of uh, electricity, that's a lot of electric power. That's it guys, I hope you have enjoyed as much as I did. We've seen the technology works. Now, let's go back to the electric racing cars. What an incredible facility, providing so much green energy to so many people. Lucas posted this selfie on Instagram, pointing out that although it may look like the sun, the light in the sky behind him is compressed sun rays from 7,400 mirrors, each of which are the size of a tennis court. The scale of the plant is unbelievable. As Lucas said earlier though, it's time to get back to electric cars. Back to the circuit, Mulai El Hassan in Marrakesh, where just one day after the main race, the paddock played host to the only day of on-track testing during the season. With the teams having to use drivers that haven't yet competed in an ABB Formula E race weekend, it's a chance for racers from different backgrounds and disciplines to experience the most advanced all-electric racing machines in the world. One rookie driver taking to the track was 20-year-old French speedster Sasha Fenestras, fresh off the back of winning the Japanese Formula 3 championship in his first season. And he was given the keys to James Collado's Panasonic Jaguar racing car. It's, it's nice, it's uh, completely different. It's incredible the, the difference between the 200 kilowatts and 250, so something it's very difficult to find your limits, very easy to do mistakes, as, as I expected really. So uh, it's good to be back on city tracks, which I kind of miss it. And um, I mean, my, my target and one of my goals is to be here in a couple of years, hopefully. Uh, but of course, it's a very nice championship. You see the races until the last lap is just on the limit and everything. So very excited. And um, I think it's a very good championship and it's kind of the future as well. So hopefully I can be here one day. Another young hotshot who took to the circuit was 21-year-old Thomas Preining. The Austrian's blossoming career has seen him impress in several championships for motoring giants Porsche. And after earning the position of test and development driver with the German team, he was looking forward to taking their ABB Formula E car for a spin. The car feels great. Uh, first time obviously driving it for me. I know it from the sim a little bit, but uh, the real deal is different. Since Porsche is new, every, every kilometer on track is important. You always gather information and that's what we're here for today. It's a completely different world to be honest. Uh, a lot of different factors uh, are important in Formula E. Um, at the moment I'm just trying to understand the whole concept and the car and um, getting up to grips with everything. First time working on track with the team too, so I'm happy. Most drivers follow a similar path in their pursuit of a career in motorsport, starting to compete from a very young age. 28-year-old British racer Jan Mardenborough, however, didn't compete seriously until age 19. After winning an international gaming competition, he was given a drive with Nissan in a professional race. He's been a pro driver ever since and was once again representing Nissan during the Marrakesh test. Today, um, with Nissan Edams, the guys have got a lot of items which they've been working on back home. And I'm just there as a driver just to give you know, accurate feedback. I've tried, I tried them on the sim a couple of days ago and it's a big difference. And hopefully it's as positive as they uh, engineered it to be. It's just fun to be back on the back and track, on a street circuit, sliding the car and having fun. It's always interesting to see how racers from other disciplines get on behind the wheel of a Formula E Gen 2 car. And there's no doubt we'll see some of these amazing drivers in the most competitive lineup in motorsport in the near future. Despite the cancellation of the recent Geneva Motor Show, manufacturers all over the world have still been launching their brand new concept and production cars. German car maker BMW announced the concept version of the i4 all electric saloon. Planned to go into production in 2021, the i4 is BMW's first all electric car since the well known i3 that was launched in 2013. It's got an electric motor that puts out the equivalent of 523 brake horsepower and was developed in house by BMW with input from their Formula E team. The four-wheel drive system gets it to 100 kilometers per hour in four seconds, 
and onto a top speed of around 200 kilometers per hour. The design of the BMW Concept i4, I think, uh, transmits the fact that it's a zero emission vehicle, so it's an exceptionally clean design, but it also uh, showcases everything that we want to express uh, in a BMW. Uh, it is dynamic, even when it's uh, standing still. It is very precise and sharp, and as such, uh, I think it expresses our new form language really well. The i4 is a sign of what's to come for BMW, the first electric vehicle for seven years, and the start of a whole range of electric vehicles, including the iX3 SUV and the long-awaited iNext. The iNext is BMW's upcoming technological flagship model, and the heavily camouflaged electric SUV has recently seen some extreme weather testing in the Kalahari Desert. It will feature semi-autonomous driving technology and is very much a statement for BMW's electric future. On the other side of the planet, Korean automaker Hyundai launched their brand new concept, the Prophecy EV. The aerodynamic silhouette of the Prophecy is only possible because of its electric powertrain. With a battery pack spanning the floor of the vehicle, the cabin is stretched out to provide occupants with a far more comfortable environment. The Prophecy is controlled by joysticks to emphasize Hyundai's focus on autonomous driving, and they can retreat into the dashboard to give passengers a relaxing experience. The same concept of trying to liberate the space that we get from the electric platform came into the ergonomic uh, interface with the driver. So we worked with the AWTH of Aachen on creating a digital communication. And um, by using the joysticks, you have a more precise interface with the driver, but at the same time, we don't have the steering wheel that we have to retract for the lifestyle mode. There's no specific plans to put the Prophecy into production at the moment, but it does signify Hyundai's plans to focus on innovative solutions for autonomous driving and the design flexibility that an EV platform provides. Whilst the worldwide pandemic of the coronavirus has put the sporting world on pause, the ABB Formula E championship standings are on hold too. Currently sitting in first place is Antonio Felix da Costa. He's fast, he's funny, and he's definitely the most talented trophy thrower in the game. He may be sitting on top of the standings, but his route to get there has been anything but straightforward. So let's take a look at his season so far. Before the season began, Antonio ended his five-year relationship with BMW to join reigning team's champions DS to Cheetah, partnering reigning driver's champion Jean-Éric Verne. On paper, it seemed like a dream move to a top-tier team, but at the first race in Diria, Saudi Arabia, all that promise quickly unraveled. A poor qualifying session saw Antonio just under four seconds off the pace of the front runners, and after a 21st place start, he could only make it up to a 14th place finish. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, man. Qualify better tomorrow and we go from there. The next day, Antonio looked fast, topping free practice ahead of the second race of the doubleheader weekend. He also set the fastest overall time in the qualifying group stages and landed himself fifth position in Super Bowl. It was all looking much more positive until disaster struck during the race. De Costa's hit Buemi and spun him round. What the, what the oh. idiot! I want the penalty for Da Costa in the one. I'm really sorry for him, but I, there is nothing I could do. Nothing. Drive score penalty, Antonio. Drive score penalty. It's not fair. There was nothing I could do. That clash with Buemi was costly, dropping him out of second place and eventually finishing in 13th, though he was later promoted to 10th after a raft of post-race penalties were applied across the field. Round three in Santiago was a chance for Antonio to take back control of his season. In scorching temperatures, he qualified in 10th position and had work to do. Through the race, he climbed and climbed, as did his teammate Jean-Eric Verne, and with just 14 minutes to go, Jeb was in third with Antonio in fourth. A strong showing for DS to Cheetah until Jeb picked up some damage to his front wing. He decided to try and push on and maintain his place, much to his teammates' annoyance. Jeb, this is not how a factory driver works, you understand? His car is smoking like f***. He's not moving out of the way. 
We own it, we own it. No, you're not! He's closing the door! We can win this race! Once Jev was out of the way, Antonio pushed ahead and managed to take the lead with less than three minutes to go. Good job, mate. He kept on top for the final few laps until out of nowhere, his radio burst into life. Start 48, you need to cool down the batteries. You need to cool down the battery now. Thanks to his soaring battery temperature, Antonio was forced to watch as Gunter made the overtake to take the win on the very last lap. It may have been his first podium for the team, but missing out on the win so late in the race was hard to take. Fantastic, Antonio. Well done. Very well done. Yeah, I cannot say the same from your side, unfortunately, this time, mate. At the following race in Mexico, the Tachita teammates started alongside each other and were once again running together on the track. I'm so much quicker than him. No swap position with Jeff. This time, they decided that they were not going to have a repeat of Santiago's drama and ordered John Eric Verne to move aside and allow Antonio through to attack the podium. And then a crash for second place Sam Bird allowed Antonio to take the second step of the podium for the second race in a row. Nice one. Good job, guys. Very good job. See you at the podium. At the following round in Marrakesh, Antonio was clearly getting comfortable in his DS to Cheetah car taking his first pole position of the season. Very good lap, Antonio, very good lap. He led the race from the start before getting engaged in a strategy battle with Max Gunter behind. Antonio initially lost P1 to Gunter, but this turned out to be a strategic win for the Tachita driver. Plan B. Copy, it's all of it. I have it under control. Being in second place meant he could sit in the slipstream, pushing Gunter into using more energy whilst conserving more of his own. Just four laps after losing the lead, Antonio used his attack mode to cruise past Gunter and then put his energy advantage to work. He ended the race a huge 11 seconds ahead of anyone else. With that win, he cemented his lead in the championship and a strong statement of his intention to taking the driver's title from his team. Yes! Let's go, boys! In this unprecedented situation that we're all living through, our championship leader took to Instagram to share a message of hope and positivity, reminding us all that despite these hard times, together we will overcome. Good on you, Antonio. We can't wait to see you racing again as soon as possible. The motorsport world might be on hold, but that didn't stop the latest exciting electric beast from being introduced. We're in the age of the electric hypercar, in which we have already seen incredibly powerful machines like the Pininfarina Batista and the Lotus Avaya announced on the world stage. Originally planned to be launched at the cancelled Geneva Motor Show was the first EV from British performance manufacturer Apex. So a little while ago, we headed to an event in London to check out their new baby, the AP0. It's designed and built to be as lightweight as possible, prioritizing handling over raw power. In 2020, it's not unusual for electric supercars to be announced with horsepower ratings well into the thousands. Yet the AP0's electric motor puts out just 650. That's still enough to get it to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.3 seconds. But crucially, it brings the price way down to less than a tenth of what the Batista or Avaya would set you back. The AP0 is, at its heart, it's an electric supercar. We really went out of our way with a design to make it look agile and engaging and have a very clear character. We're not chasing headline figures. We're not looking for, you know, 1,000 horsepower, 1,500 horsepower. We're not looking for the biggest, biggest battery. You can't, you, you can't build something that's engaging and agile and fast if you're going to make it heavy. So with this, we're looking for usable performance. So we've made the battery a bit smaller, but we're going to get something that's still a high-performance car that's great to drive. The thing about Formula E is it's relevant. You're looking at a mix of technologies. I mean, Formula E has given us lots and lots of uh, ad advances in high-performance powertrain. The better the batteries get, the better the cars get, 
the better the better the batteries get, the lighter the cars get. We see this future, we know this is coming, we know the technology is improving and it's only going to get better and better and better. At every Formula E event, there's loads of activities to get involved in at the E Village. And at the last round in Marrakesh, there was a lot to get excited about, including the adrenaline fueled stunt team Ride the World, pulling out all the tricks on BMXs, mountain bikes, and motorbikes. Electric ones, of course. So we made Ride the World a couple of years ago. It's actually Julian Dupont, who is a trial moto guy. He was making shows and he didn't want to put his name on, so he decided to find a name, and the name that came first, that was Ride the World. And then from that, we made a company of it, and now we are making shows all around the world, so mountain bike and BMX and trial motor shows. Uh, I mean, you know, we decided to use an electric bike because, uh, I mean, this is, this is the future, right? Like, everything, the cars are getting electric, the bicycles are getting electric, might as well the motorbike getting into the game, you know? And uh, we decided to be one of the first guys to actually do the shows on the trial electric, and, it opens up like the opportunity to make shows in like small places into town so there is no noise, no gas, no pollution, anything. So that was our main thing, you know, like, trying to get more people involved into what we do. For the two guys that ride the, uh, the electric motorbike, for them it's been a little bit of a, of a struggle in the beginning, of course, because they've been riding moto for like 20 years, like a um, gas one, and then now it's uh, an electric one. Of course, the power is not the same, it's different. I mean, you know, it, it takes time to get used to, but as far as now, yeah, they love it. And they say it's lighter, it's a different power, but it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. They love it now. We used to have fun on gas, motor, gas cars, but now being one of the first guys to actually have fun on an electric motorcycle or, or the bikes, it's, I mean, we're proud of it. It's super cool because we're not killing the planet anymore. And it's just, yeah, super cool. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to be part of this. Formula E has always been an accessible sport and at every race hundreds of people get the chance to meet the drivers. At round 4 in Mexico however, Formula E gave one superfan an extra treat for his birthday, pulling out all the stops to give him a VIP experience. Five-year-old Ian enjoyed all that the E Village had to offer was even given a pit lane tour where he met his favourite driver, Audi's Lucas Degrassi. Hey, how are you? Good, good. You like the car? Lucas even had a special gift for him. I think we have a, I think we have a small present for you. We have a small present for you. I think you're going to like it. His own custom Formula E race suit. Race overall. Perfect. Maybe we'll see Ian behind the wheel of a Formula E car one day soon. Well, he'll probably need to be able to reach the pedals first. That's all for this week's episode of Street Racers. But don't worry, as we'll be back soon with even more from the amazing all-electric world of ABB Formula E. We'll be keeping you up to date on the latest news regarding the racing calendar, new electric vehicle announcements, and some amazing stories of how green technology is changing the world for the better. Stay safe and healthy, Street Racers.